The core thing here when we're talking about people running is that we need to encourage any kind of candidates and certainly any candidates we're going to give support to, to be talking about demands and to be pledging to, to certain demands. So uh, segueing into demands, we need to be thinking about what these can look like. You know, I've come up with a list and that's on my favorite website and yours, erictred.com. At the moment, you have 11 of them, so I figured I'd call it 11 Demands for Real Democracy. And that's right, uh, these demands go to 11. And what does that make us think of? <laughs> Spinal Tap. If you can see, yeah. the numbers all go to 11. Why don't you just make 10 and make that a little louder? <laughs> these go to 11. Damn it. <laughs> Classic bit there. Yeah. <laughs> So, going to 11, well, should we talk about some demands? Let's do it. All right. So, number one, healthcare. One of the things that I think if if we're going to put together a list of demands is we shouldn't be settling for the half measures. We shouldn't be settling for for the compromises. And one of the things that's always said about uh, Medicare for all is that even that's a compromise. And so number one is the idea of, of demanding beyond that, implement a the United States national health care system, essentially what the UK has, you know, um, but make it better. Figure out what are the best parts of their systems, what are the parts that you don't want to emulate. We can make a really good health care system. I mean, it's, you know, we know how to do it. It's a matter of... Well, you know, the usual things of, of getting the, the big for-profit players out of it is what's going to have to happen so it's you know include all the best aspects of other systems around the world reject all privatization you know you really have to get profit out of the system you know, you know private profit it's just not compatible with health <laughs> really and so not with a healthcare system and you don't want it to cover all aspects you know it, you know really it's it's this stuff has been been talked about for a while it's really not a big mystery <laughs> how you can do this um, yeah, I think another big thing with with here is is that the healthcare system should be accessible and understandable by a layperson. I say this all the time about laws, mm-hmm. is that the problem with laws is they're written so that you need a law degree. You take the Constitution, the foundation of our country and our laws, the Constitution was written for a layperson to be able to read and understand it. It's very simple, similar to how the, um, the amendment for uh, Citizens United and taking the... Oh, right. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah, but... Uh, but to amend move to amend. But yeah, so there, there's there's been a, a whole field that it, within the healthcare system of healthcare navigators of people that help people navigate through the system. That is, that's, a, that's a problem. So it, with, if, if, you, if you've got a system that, that you need to pay someone to help someone else navigate right then there's a, a problem. bad system <laughs> right and so with with the national health care system some, something that a lay person can easily understand they understand what plan they're in they understand what plan what their options are in their health care team so you know really shouldn't be something hard to agree on <laughs> you know because it's one of those things that that just has huge support you know all across the political spectrum uh, respond to the climate emergency you know obviously <laughs> It has to be really a non-corporate. It has to be a real grassroots Green New Deal and not just another way to give more money to huge corporations. It has to be something more like uh, the original New Deal, what FDR did, things like that. Things like um, federal jobs guarantee, you know, big public works programs, all that can can go into it. But it's not going to happen if the plan is to get private corporations to, to jump in and do it. That's the opposite. Um, end all drilling and extraction of federal property, you know, end subsidies to fossil fuel companies, you know, massively expand green subsidies. So really pretty, pretty low hanging fruit stuff, I think. Yeah, definitely. Criminal justice reform. Now for, for this one, I do um, basically a little bit of a cheat and I, um, and I reference uh, the Ten Demands for Justice, which is something that um, Nick and others at Revolutionary Blackout Network uh, g- came up with. Um, and I think we can take a peek at that. Yeah, so definitely check out the Ten Demands for Justice at tenforjustice.com. 
Uh, they have put together a, a great list as, a, as, it, a, as it applies to the criminal justice system, and so there's no point in us trying to replicate it. Uh, the, the basis is, uh, is to end uh, carceral punishment for any kind of unnecessary uh, person, basically. They, any, they any call kind it the of, road to abolition. The road to abolition, yeah. So basically, that means abolition both of, of policing as we know it and of prisons and the and carceral prison. state as we know it. Right, yeah. So, uh, you know, basically turning the criminal justice system into what it's supposed to be, which is a rehabilitatory arm uh, based on law enforcement being within the community and controlled by the community. Basically looking to, to end what, what you're having with the, with the abuse of, of, for example, the 13th Amendment with all kinds of essentially prison slave labor, all the bad things that happen within the criminal justice system, plea bargaining, just all the, all the really uh, very, very disruptive and, and really kind of evil things that happen in the criminal justice system uh, to, to try to remedy that. So, yeah, for, for those demands, we've referenced the 10 Demands for Justice. We don't have time to do a deep dive into them, but one of them that I will highlight, which is very important, is is reparations. And and reparations can be tricky because a lot of people will talk about reparations, but you know what's what's really meant by that. And so I, I think they did a really good job in here of, of talking about an approach to to really getting a handle on that. They're talking about uh, the commission to study reparation act and mandating Congress to 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 implement what that comes up with. They also uh, mentioned uh, Native Americans and and those aspects of of reparations. All right, back to the 11 demands list. Uh, Number four, uh, implement a minimum standard of living. And what I'm kind of trying to do with this one is, is again, to think bigger to not just be coming in, not, not just be demanding $15 minimum wage, you know, at, at this point, I mean, of course, that's even you know, way lower <laughs> than it even should be. Uh, but it, it, that's, that's, that's a compromise demand to even start with. So you know, I'm, I'm proposing, like, you know, let's, let's increase the minimum wage and step with how the wages of the top 1% have increased. You know, let's take a look at that and you'll see this, this you know, this steep <laughs> up uh, line of how their wages have gone up and so you know let's look at you know, can we be doing that for the 99 percent if you're talking about standard of living of course that gets you into things like housing you know homes for all housing first programs all those kind of things and i know homelessness houselessness and whatnot is a big issue for you Corey. yeah definitely and, and i'm one that believes uh because I'm, I'm kind of a crime guy criminology guy i'm one that believes that the lack of housing and health care and economic opportunities is the basis for a lot of, of what we consider to be crime. So what what it really comes down to and what number four, I think, is really talking about is is just to lessening human suffering of, of our fellow citizens. And by, by doing that and by elevating up people's standard of living, uh, we're just going to end up with, with a better, more equitable society as it is. Like, can we have a country that's not brutal? <laughs> Like, how's that for a demand? <laughs> yeah, what it comes down to is that people are living vastly different lives in the, in the U.S., and it's about elevating up those that are, are living below those that are uh, eating 10 times their share. And so we have to even that. Speaking of eating, you know, there's the idea to create free and open food pantries. I mean, you know, we could do this. <laughs> But, you know, America is as wealthy as anything, is what I like to say. And, you know, we could do that. We could just have you know, federally funded food pantries that are just there for people who need food and they can get it as needed. It's not, it's not that hard to do. Provide a good job at a living wage to anyone who wants one, otherwise known as the federal job guarantee. And that can get you into things like... Um, you know, MMT style thinking that that can be tied into MMT and that the funds are there. The government can create money at will. And and if you're creating money and putting it into into jobs, it's not going to be inflationary. In fact, there are MMT economists who, who make really good arguments that creating money, injecting it federal dollars into the economy towards things like federal jobs, towards like like jobs for people who need jobs is actually anti-inflationary. It actually ships money into the economy and it cycles through and it does the opposite of inflation. 
Yeah, I mean, that makes sense to me. I mean, you get you give people higher wages, that, that money's coming right back into the economy. When you give rich people money, that, that goes to offshore bank accounts, and mm -hmm. it doesn't stay in the economy. Luxury goods, even in yeah. things that just don't. It don't help us. Well, even just to, even just looking at the the stimulus checks, which happened over the pandemic, uh, that was beneficial to the economy and the and the citizenry. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a, a good example of of not 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 inflation not, wasn't happening then. It wasn't no, you know? and and even though I I don't think that that how that went about was the right way to distribute it. It did it did create a a use case in showing that it was possible. Things got better for a lot of people with that money. Mm -hmm. Mandate paid parental leave. Um, yeah. Eliminate student loan debt. You know, these are, you know, can be big topics, you know, on their own. But they they get into this whole idea of of, you know, a standard of living that everyone could at least abide by. Yeah, definitely. And I know that we've talked about this that the student loan debt can also be kind of a questionable one because there is a certain amount of privilege that somebody with student loans do have. But you know, it's still important. The other thing too we is we can figure it out. It yeah, <laughs> no, it's it's. I'm just saying it's not wouldn't be my top of the list. But the other thing too is is uh, is. In terms of like, you know, if, if people are wondering, like, is it this bad? It, in fact, it is. You know, I live in the city. It's a little bit easier when you live in the city. There's there's all kinds of different people on the economic ladder. Uh, but, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that people are starving in our country. It's a, it's a national shame. And, and that's something we need to care about. Moving on to number five. And the wars. Cut military spending. Again, it's something, one of these that really should be low-hanging fruit for, for the left. Really really for anyone who's not a neocon or a warmonger, you would think, but there's so much propaganda out there that it, it's like, whatever happened to the anti-war movement, you know, you gotta, you gotta wonder. It, yeah. I mean, unless you hold stock in Raytheon or Lockheed Martin, war does not benefit you. It just period. And so, you know, I would say we should have a demand of, you know, at least, you know, reduce the military budget by 20%, you know, each year. And even that, you know, you can make an argument for, you know, is, is that not nearly enough? Is that um, outlandish? It's, you know, it's, you know, maybe a starting point. And I, I see other, other demands out there from groups who will sometimes say things like, you know, our demand is we, we stop increases in military spending. <laughs> you know, that, that's like a, a Democratic Party aligned style demand. <laughs> And I'm, I'm just like, no, we should be we should be advocating deep cuts. Yeah, definitely. And and let, let's let's say even you are one of the people that for whatever reason you you believe that the United States should maintain the the highest military. You know, it, it most most money going to military in the, in the world. We we can still significantly cut back significantly and still be the biggest military in the world. It is just mean, ins mean we, we might only be five times the rest yeah. of the world combined instead of ten times. <laughs> yeah, if, if if you're not up to the numbers, which I'm sure a lot of people are, it is just insane the amount of money that we give to the military industrial complex. It's one of those. It's one of those things that this the scale of the military spending and, and the, our military footprint around the world. It's one of those things that's just so huge, so gargantuan, so kind of hard to take in that it, it almost it almost it, it benefits them it's like if, if people if, if what we might call the the quote-unquote normies start start looking into it, it it's like they their their brains just shut off because it's just too too much to comprehend how bad it is yeah definitely and on this bulletin point too talking about uh patriot act espionage act the, these have uh the the military industrial complex has its intersection within mass surveillance to mass surveillance of the of the public Mm -hmm. uh yeah and we're seeing it now in the censorship and and all that things and censorship is going to be an item below while we're still on this one um sale of military weapons i mean it, like do you remember cory when um arms dealers used to be considered bad guys <laughs> <laughs> and now uh, we yeah. Are one. <laughs> yeah the biggest one in fact i mean how is that even a thing you know so you know obviously that we need to demand for that to, to stop. I mean, it, it just <laughs> it just needs to stop. It's you know the, the idea that that this is our thing. <laughs> yeah, this is one of our biggest um, uh, areas and businesses of manufacturing left in the U.S. Yeah, I mean we we are guns and uh, giving them to 
anyone who wants to buy them, including well-enlightened democracies like Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Saudi Arabia. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a whole nother can of worms, <laughs> our relationship with Saudi Arabia. But yeah, what it comes down to is we are the biggest arms dealer and uh, we accept cash, credit, debit. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly cash, US dollars. Bitcoin, Ethereum. <laughs> If you have if you have assets, we'll take them and we'll give you weapons. Well, we we get the assets regardless, but the resources, but <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so one of the the places of pushback you'll get is, is what about the jobs? You know, people are, are gonna are gonna lose jobs, and and you know the counter to that is you know the next bullet point: you you replace these military jobs with you know federal jobs guaranteeing green jobs. It can be all kinds of things. You yeah, know, in the sciences. I mean, we we. It, it's really not a hard problem if yeah. we decide to tackle it as a country. Yeah, definitely. It's 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 who we. There's plenty of mm-hmm. other jobs, better jobs, we can give people. Mm-hmm. We don't need these military industrial complex jobs. And of course, this ties into imperialist policies, which of course we can do a whole show on that. But yeah, but that really needs to be to be reformed in a big way. Just just how how we act on the world stage and and what we're about. And also, uh, you know, just just for for the people that 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 work within the military, like their military enlisted people, uh, you know, that that that's also a very abusive workplace. If I can just say one little anecdote, one thing that somebody mm-hmm. once told me is they said that at at one point the army uh, had had a cook's corps. There were cooks from the army, and they that was that was their job. They they cooked all these meals, and it was a it was a proud thing. You know, people were able to do that. Several years ago, the uh, the military, uh, the army rather, because it's not the same with every service. The army got rid of their cook's corps, and they hired Cisco, the company, to do all of their food service. And it is stupid expensive. I can't give you the exact numbers, but there's basically no cheaper labor, legal labor that you can have outside of a prison in the US than an army private. They're essentially US government government property and they they're paid very very little. And so uh, all that contracting that went in the military industrial complex, it literally is just to, to benefit those that benefit from those contracts because we went from having a, a completely uh, cheap way of, of feeding the army soldiers to, to having Cisco do it poorly, mind you, for a huge amount of cash. So that, that also gets into the privatization issue and just all that, that BS. And then there's... You know, I'll just hit the last one quick here. Pro- prohibit U.S. intelligence agencies from conducting propaganda and psyop operations against our own people. It, it used to be illegal for those agencies to do propaganda type programs on the American people, on, on the U.S. public. And I think it was in the AUMF. They basically repealed that. <laughs> and so, you know, obviously that's that's something that that should be prevented, that should be uh, prohibited. And because of course a big part of this is um, is propaganda. And that's um, something our friend Caitlin Johnstone talks about. Um, she accurately describes the um, American citizens as the most propagandized populace in the world. And uh, I think that's very true. I agree. Immigration reform. Um, this one's nice and simple, as it yeah. should be. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes and no. I mean, there there could be more items in this. You know, as I'm always saying with all of this, you know, the the intent is to collaborate. You know, and not to to pass this down like Moses coming down from the hill with the tablets. But um, but yeah, at least uh, hitting immigration reform. You know, abolishing ICE. We don't need it. We didn't yeah. used to have it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, unless unless you're a Native American, uh, I don't think you have a good claim for immigration being bad. <laughs> if you're a Native American, then you have a great claim for it being bad. Uh, I had a teacher once tell me that if there's ever a day when, when people around the world no longer want to come to the United States for opportunity, then that's the day you no longer want to be here. Immigration is what makes this country great, period. And, of course, we want to provide a real path to citizenship for everyone. All right, number seven is a big one, censorship. As we've been seeing recently, the, the censorship just only seems to, uh, to get worse and worse. And they are, you know, they're, they're finding new and innovative ways to censor, whether it's Twitter, YouTube. Now, we're, recently, we're seeing censorship via PayPal and 
and these companies that do the monetary transactions. In Canada, you saw Trudeau and his goons just not even think twice about just saying, oh, we're going to go after bank accounts of protesters. Because, you know, because they have, what was his word for it, unacceptable opinions. <laughs> so, yeah, protect freedom of speech from censorship. And, you know, whether that's coming from government or corporations, which, of course, isn't such a, um, a big difference anymore. You see them working hand in hand. Um, you got uh, government threatening uh, Silicon Valley and tech companies to do what they want or face regulation and antitrust actions. You have uh, the corporations in Silicon Valley doing the bidding of government in pretty pretty direct hand in hand ways. Uh, you get things like uh, uh, breaking up the large corporations, uh, like reorganizing them, you know, worker co op style things like that. Because I mean, you you can go beyond simply breaking them up. Like there is that idea of you know you could reorganize them. And, and give them to the employees. And if these companies are being run by their employees, you're going to have a lot better shot at having better policies and better leadership. Uh, it's the idea of um, common carrier style rules. And this is where, where things like if you, um, it applies to like your telephone, your, your, and even your cell phone, things like that, where they're, they're basically mandated to, um, to provide the service for everybody. And it's not this idea that, oh, if someone says the wrong thing you know, on the phone, that, that, that they can get their phone cut off. If there's something that problematic happening on the service, then it sh it'll be illegal under, under the law, and you, you bring legal authorities into it, and you process it from there. That's the concept of due process, which touches on this next one, you know, even within the terms of service and how these uh, corporations and these media companies are running, you, you can have rules and regulations that disallow these deletions and deplatforming, except where they have a real due process. And that's, you know, transparent and fair and democratic. And the other big one with, um, with these tech companies and places like YouTube and Twitter are the algorithms. Uh, which are quite completely opaque, and so that needs to be made um, be tra transparent. It's a big public needs to be looked at. You can do things like opening them up more along, you know, open source type of, of grounds. And so what, what they do right now with these algorithms is is they they're made to addict you to the service to to just keep you coming back, and and they don't care whether they're pulling you in a lefty direction or a right direction or whether they're pulling you towards scientific, real scientific facts and truths or whether they're pulling you towards conspiracy things or things that are not true. Like, like they don't care. They, they just want you to keep keep clicking, keep viewing, keep the eyeballs on it because that's, that's where the money is. And it's all about um, the ad revenues and the profits. And so in order to fix that, you, you're gonna have to deal with the algorithms. Uh, that's going to, to mean, you know, opening those up and looking at those and regulating them in some fashion or like in the previous point, you know, reorganizing the corporation itself. Yeah, definitely. I know that you've talked about open source being uh, something that, that we want to look for in the platforms we use. All right. So these first seven are kind of what I view as the, the, the policy ones.